Welcome back to Catalyst University. My name is Kevin Tokoff. Please make sure to like this video and subscribe to my channel for future videos and notifications. And a big thank you to my patrons on Patreon for your contributions to my channel. In this video, we're gonna do an overview of the subclavius muscle. This is one of those muscles I don't really ever remember talking about in undergraduate anatomy or exercise physiology. It's one of those where when you're in professional school and you're learning all the muscles, that's usually where most people first see it, most of them. In the first part of the video, we'll just kind of hit the more obvious stuff. So for most professional schools, this is kind of what you'd have to know right here. And then we'll go over another function of subclavius that's really more of a function and not an action in the sense that it doesn't have anything to do with the contractile properties of the muscle. It's really more of a structural function, so to speak. All right, so let's do a brief overview of the anatomy over here. So of course we have the clavicle. The clavicle has two ends. Here's the sternal end of the clavicle where it articulates with the manubrium of the sternum right here. This would actually be the right sternoclavicular joint. Over on this end, this is the distal end of the clavicle, or it's acromial end. You can see it articulating with the acromion of the scapula, so this would therefore be the AC joint, or acromioclavicular joint. And coming off of the manubrium right here, we actually see the costal cartilage of rib number one. Now, rib number one actually articulates posteriorly with vertebra T1. And so if we follow rib one from the T1 vertebra, it's going to loop out here, and then it's going to track underneath the clavicle. And then here's the costochondral junction of rib one, costal cartilage of rib one, and then its articulation with the manubrium of the sternum. Okay, And then down here is rib two, but that's not really applicable here. So you can see here the subclavius muscle in green. It's named that because sub means below, and it's right below the clavicle. The origin is on rib one, the bony part that is, and then there's a little bit of origin on the costochondral junction and a little bit on the cartilage of rib one right here. You can see the direction of the muscle fibers. They're really running more horizontally and out where they're going to insert really on the underside of the clavicle at the subclavian groove, okay? Now the action of the subclavius is really clavicular depression, so bringing the clavicle down, and rib one elevation bringing the first rib up. So more or less when this muscle contracts, it would bring rib one and the clavicle closer together because it spans between the two bones, right? If you think about inhalation, that is supposed to bring the ribs up because we're increasing the size of the thoracic cavity for the sake of the lungs. So we need to bring all the ribs up, right? So if we think of active inhalation, when we really need to use a lot of other muscles other than the intercostals and the diaphragm to increase that thoracic cage size, we may actually start recruiting the subclavius a little bit more for active inhalation. So it will bring that rib one up closer to the clavicle. The subclavius muscle is innervated by nerve to subclavius, which has nerve root components C5 and C6. This is a nerve that comes directly off of the superior trunk of the brachial plexus. So if you go back and look at that information, before the trunks ever start giving divergences and mixing up to form the cords, you'll actually see a couple branches coming off of the superior trunk. One is a branch to supraspinatus, and then this one is actually coming to subclavius. Okay. Now a little bit more anatomy here that has to do with the subclavius' other function. So if we look at the clavicle right here, and we can see the first rib that's kind of coming out from T1 and traversing under the clavicle, there's a space right here between the clavicle and the first rib. Now this is really the costoclavicular space, okay? And if you look really carefully here, you'll actually see several structures that are moving underneath the subclavius muscle, but above the first rib. The first one right here is really the subclavian vein. Technically, when the vein and artery cross over the margin of the first rib, they're renamed to axillary. So right there where it's crossing underneath the subclavius, it's probably still subclavian vein. Over here where it's pointing to, it's actually the axillary vein here, but that's not really super important. Here's the subclavian slash axillary artery. And then right here, these would actually be cords of the brachial plexus. And so all of these structures right here are passing over the first rib, but underneath the subclavius muscle. So let's think about why that might be important. Here's another view of this. We've got the clavicle right here. Here's rib one. In green, we have the subclavius muscle. And here's the 
axillary vein or subclavian vein, axillary artery, and the brachial plexus components. So what would actually happen if the clavicle was fractured? And it's a very relevant question because the clavicle is actually the most commonly fractured long bone in the human body. In fact, a clavicular fracture is very common in contact sports. See so here, Tony Romo, who was on the Dallas Cowboys, was notorious for breaking his clavicle. And when the clavicle fractures, it has the potential to splinter and damage other structures. Well, these are some really important structures right here. These take blood to and from the upper extremity, and then the nerves obviously go out to the upper extremity for operating all the muscles and having sensation and all that. So what would happen if the subclavius wasn't there? And that clavicle fractures, well, you have the potential for the fragments and pointy edges and all that stuff to puncture the axillary vein or puncture the axillary artery or lesion these nerves that are coming from the brachial plexus. And that would be very, very bad. And so a structural function of the subclavius muscle is actually that it really provides some cushioning. Even in this position right here, it really provides some cushioning to these structures. But in the event that the clavicle actually breaks, those fragments are going to have to get through the subclavius first before they can cause significant damage to these structures. So I'd be willing to bet that you could actually live without the contractile action of the subclavius. There's a lot of other muscles that are promoting inhalation. They're all working together. You might experience a little tiny deficit in that, but you could certainly live without its action. So really, I would argue the more important function of subclavius is its non-contractile function, and that's in the cushioning of these structures right here. So there's some natural cushioning even without a fracture, but with a fracture, you better not damage these things, otherwise your upper extremity is seriously in trouble. So hopefully this video gave you a good understanding of the structure and functions of the subclavius muscle. Thanks for tuning in. Please like, subscribe, and check out my Instagram for cool science and not science stuff.